so good afternoon, everyone. Um, the intention of this talk was just to give a, uh, I'm sorry, overview of all the background components that observers are going to have to deal with for JWST data preparation, and also not only different components, but how to mitigate and some good practices to, to have good data to work with. So this is a brief overview of uh, all JWC instruments. We have three near infrared instruments and one mid infrared instrument. The near infrared go from about 0.6 to 5 microns, and the mid infrared, the MIDI goes from 5 to about 29 microns. And the intention of uh, showing this slide is just the fact that different background components have different impacts at different wavelengths, so that has to be considered when planning your observations. There are like two big families of background. One is the background generated on the sky itself, and that is the zodiac zodiacal background, the diffuse galactic uh, radiation, and also diffuse radiation from extragalactic sources. And then we have the background generated or produced by the telescope itself. And in those we have the stray light, which is pretty much uh, a spurious light that reaches the science path and goes into your instrument. Self emission from the observatory, and that includes the mirrors, the, the shield, the sun shield and the instrument, and finally the detector noise. So I'm going to start with uh, sky background components. The first is the diffuse galactic radiation, which is mostly starlight that is reprocessed and uh, by the interstellar material and uh, affects it kind of contaminates your, your observations. We also have diffuse radiation from extractive sources, and that can be, for instance, distant quasars that can uh, just have diffuse emission. And the zodiacal background that has two main components. The first one, which is obvious at uh, short wavelengths, shorter than four microns, it is sunlight scattered by interplanetary dust. And the second one, which is important, the longer wavelengths, longer than four microns, that is sunlight absorbed by interplanetary dust, and then it gets remitted as a thermal emission in the infrared. This here is just uh, a map from the Dirigo mission. It's for the shorter wavelengths that would affect mostly. Um, near Cam, near Speck, and, and near East. And uh, you can see the galactic plane, and this is mostly dominated by stars. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite bright. If we move to the more mid-infrared, this is what would affect mostly MIDI. The galactic plane is not so bright anymore. There are some stars, but it's not as, as important. And now you see the zodiacal emission affecting. Uh, this is the ecliptic and, and kind of the path that the sun uh, follows through and you really see bright diffuse emission in there that will be included in your observations. Um, so this has, other than the description, we, we also have to think about uh, variation. There are two types of variation, temporal variation and spatial variation. Um, most models, uh, I think all of them, they assume that uh, galactic foreground and extragalactic background emission they do not change in time. On the other hand, the zodiacal emission, it does change in time. And this is a, um, this, this is a plot at 3.6 microns, and it has data from both Spitzer and uh, Dirby. And you can see that at this uh, wavelength, well, the green points from Spitzer are from the cold mission, and the blue ones are from the warm part of the mission. And it, it doesn't really follow a, a perfectly ideal trend, but the authors subtracted the model, and the residuals, they are uh, plus minus 40%, which is um, quite a lot, but then again, it doesn't follow a real trend. If you move uh, towards longer wavelengths, 4.5, 8 microns, then the behavior, it is much um, well organized, and once modeled and subtracted, the residuals are about plus minus uh, 6 to 4%. Um, I mean, to me, the important message of these plots is not only the variation of the residuals, but the time. So this is a time baseline of about nine years, which means that if an observer or a group would have a, uh, a deep field observation of about, I don't know, 200, 300 hours, in that time scale, you shouldn't see significant time variations in your data. If you go back uh, maybe one, two years later to the same field, then probably your zodiac emission will have changed, and that's something worth considering. As for um, spatial variations, well, first, there are the obvious ones. Different regions of the sky, they will have different background emission. But there are also uh, evidences of small-scale spatial fluctuations in the same, in, in the same regions. And uh, some groups have observed that with uh, ISO and Spitzer data. 
and it's not really very significant and they have provided this sort of higher limits to that. So now I'd like to move to aspects related with the telescope itself. You've seen that today, uh, the orbit and, and the call and foresight, but just a brief reminder. So the general list is in a L2 orbit, and the sun shield is always protecting the telescope from the sun. So you have this uh, very hot side, which is at about uh, 350 K, and then the mirrors and the instruments are protected from the sun, the sun shield, and they are approximately at 40 K, which is much colder than conditions for Hubble and Earth observations. Again, the near infrared instruments, they will be operated at about 40 K and MIDI, because it's a mid infrared, it, it needs to be colder, so it has a dedicated cooler. So temperatures are quite different for all of the instruments. So the first uh, aspect I wanted to mention was a stray light. You have all this diffuse emission coming from the sky. And I think this, this uh, drawing from uh, the latest light sea paper, which by the way, it's the one to check if you're interested in this topic. So you have in this, in this uh, configuration, the telescope is pointing to some, a certain object, and the galactic center flux, the galactic center emission is hitting the sun shield, the mirror, and all the telescope components, and that is creating a certain amount of uh, stray light. And this is gonna be very relevant till about 15 microns. Uh, the stray light model is calculating them by overlay the sky emission, which you have to, towards the left. And that is, um, well, he said, like, overlaid on the redness. Uh, so you overlay the sky map with the radiative transfer function of the telescope, which is shown here to the right. You have the sun shield is blocking some part, and the primary mirror is blocking some other part. By combining these two, the sky emission plus a radiative transfer um, function from the telescope, the authors, they actually can estimate how much stray light are going to be there and contaminating. And this is just uh, a figure for a particular configuration. This is, of course, dependent, uh, it depends on the orientation and where you're looking at a certain point of, of the orbit. Another important aspect is the telescope thermal uh, emission. And this is really having an impact on MIDI. It's very relevant beyond 15 micros. So the near infrared instrument, I don't think they care much about that. Um, so there have been several groups working on this. Uh, the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center uh, people like Jane Rigby and Bowers, they have provided an actual model. And the model consists of uh, 20 black bodies. And all of these black bodies are consistent with different components of the stray light model. The mirrors, the shield, et cetera, till, till you get up to, to 20. And it gives a complete uh, view of the thermal emission of, of the telescope. Out of all the model components, the sun shield dominates at wavelengths shorter than 22 microns and the primary mirrors from there to about 28 to 29 microns. It's important to note that there is no expected variation in this thermal emission with the telescope uh, inclination. So that's something that it is an assumption. They are quite confident that that, that will be the case, but it will be tested during commissioning. There are some commissioning activity uh, requests that uh, will test that. This, this uh, plot here was actually created by Alistair, and it reflects the combination of all these components. On the shorter wavelengths, you have uh, fits to the scattered emissive and the, um, the scattered components of the zodiacal light spectrum. And then while you move to longer wavelengths, the thermal emission takes over, and that's where MIDI is gonna be mostly affected. The near infrared ones don't care about the thermal, as I said before. Um, Another aspect uh, you should consider is the detector noise. As, as Dan and Marco mentioned already, so maybe it's pretty much background limited, and um, just to mention the red noise again, it's about 14 electrons uh, RMS per uh, foliar sampling. The near infrared detectors are actually detector noise limited, and in that case, NIRSPEC has about uh, two to five electrons, five to seven electrons, uh, total noise in about a thousand seconds, and NIRCAM has about nine for the long wavelength and about uh, five to six for the short wavelength channel, again for uh, a thousand second observation. Finally, uh, one last background component that it's very, speci very, very specific to an instrument, that's the near-spec MSA leakage. And I just wanna mention it very briefly because on Wednesday you're gonna have a 
Nora talking about the newspaper I feel she's gonna get lots of features on that. But it's simply that when you're using the newspaper I feel and observing an extended emission uh, region of the sky, light from that region comes through the failed open shutters of the MSA and contaminates the IFE observations. It, it does not only come from through the open shutters, but also through the material in between the shutters. The is that there, I mean, there are um, techniques to deal with this and it will be corrected. So this is kind of an overview of all components, a sky, the telescope, thermal, the scatter, etc. But I think at the end of the day, what observers care about is about planning the observations in an efficient way. So you're sure that uh, you're going to reach the signal to know you really want and your data are going to be good enough. So in that sense, as uh, Jeff mentioned before, um, the tool to use is the ETC uh, calculator, uh, exposure time calculator developed at STSCI. It's called Pandeya. Um, the flight release that is not yet available is going to include, uh, first of all, uh, it will generate a background model. It has a background generator model based on the IPAC one. It uses COBE and, and Derby data. And that will include zodiacal emission, galactic emission, and it will generate a model for each right extension and declination of the sky using two different methods, one more reliable than the other. So it has a, a <coughs> both, uh, it can compare both and then pick and choose. It also includes the stray, stray light calculated using uh, Paul Leitz's model and a fine wavelength range <coughs> between 0.7 and 15 microns. And that is really the range in which you're interested for the stray light. And finally, it also have the telescope's thermal self-emission, which is mostly affecting the long wavelength components, and it has these 20 black bodies. Of course, it also includes the detector real noise and many other aspects, like for instance, if there is a dead time in between integrations, which that's the case for near infrared detectors, that's included in there, so you don't count that. And in summary, it has all the necessary tools to give the user a certain number of frames and you, you can be confident that your signal to noise ratio will be achieved. And um, I'd like to point that on Wednesday there's gonna be an ETC demonstration by Diane. And uh, yeah, that is not the flight version, it's only a developer version, but I think it's really worth to, to check. So now we get to the final part of the presentation, which is uh, you have your proposal, you know how long you want to integrate on the strategy, and now you have to decide how do you check the data. And that's, depend it depends on both the instrument and the type of observation you're using. I'm just showing here a few examples, and I don't know, mostly because people uh, dealing with each instrument more are gonna talk quite uh, in detail about this. But here, you have the antenna galaxy. The little um, blue square in one of the logos, that's the field of view of the MIDI IFU, the MIDI MRS. And next to it, we have the MIDI image that can take simultaneous observations. In this case, the MIDI IFU is gonna be floated with emission. And you're not gonna have any reference for your sky or your background observations in case you want to correct for that. So the ideal situation here would be to have an offset. That's just an example, the little sky region and take data in there. And that data you can use to actually correct your MRS observations from the contaminating signal. Down, there is a similar concept for the new spec um, IFU. If the object feels IFU, just go to the sky. If on the other hand you have a, a very small object, what you could do, one good option would be to do some sort of a small two-point mosaic. The common part of the mosaic may have the, the source you're interested in. The sites of the mosaic can be used to actually remove the background. This is a close-up image of one of the little new spec shutters. So in the case of the, of the um, MSA, the background, they plan to actually open, dedicate the shutters in the ideal region of the sky that will be clean, and that will be used to subtract your background signal. This is an example of, um, on top, that's a, a slit point source on a slit. And for the case of a slit, ideally you can have like, like a two point leader. And using that technique, you're gonna end up with something similar to that image there on top. You're gonna have with your own source and off source observation. And that will be used for subtracting the background. Finally, for the imager, well, these are MIDI examples, but I think they apply to all of them. It again depends on the case. If you have a deep field, which is like you have there on the left, there will be enough regions, I think, within your deep field to be able to correct the background. 
If, on the other hand, you have this, this is uh, the mirror image again on top of the central disk of St. Barrosay that's floating the whole field of view. So in that case, considering that you don't have a background reference, um, it's very bright, so it's a kind of a cheap observation in time, it will be worth to go to the sky and get some background reference there. And finally, uh, following up uh, on uh, the detector stock, uh, dithering is always a good practice. Not only improves the PSF for many of the instruments in several wavelengths and cosmetics and rejects cosmic rays, etc., but also the same region of the sky is imaged by different pixels. And that's a very good tool to actually do uh, background matching techniques and get rid of any undesired fluctuations and actually put all the observations into family. So dithers are recommended, I think, <coughs> in general. This is my last slide. Again, the full JWST weapon range. Four instruments uh, covering all the range. You are gonna always have, the sky background is gonna be there, depending on which sp spectral range you're gonna have more zodiacal or more galactic emission. A straight light will affect from about 0.5 to 15 microns, that's the dominant component. Thermal emission for 15 to about 30 microns. Detector noise, well, all detectors have noise, but only on the near infrared case, it's noise dominated detector. And the only instrument related uh, background I was talking about was um, the NISCA one, the NSA leak. Again, just a reminder, use the ATC to plan the observations and good practice like off-source observations and leaders are really recommended for dealing with the background. That's it.